Uh, welcome to the latest in Arlen Close's Trending Treasury series of webcasts. Um, my name is Nicholas Keeling. Hopefully I, I'm known to the vast majority of people on uh, the webcast. Uh, I'll be presenting this morning and I'll be discussing uh, the new National Infrastructure Bank uh, with Mark Dennison, who's a partner at uh, law firm Evershed Sutherland. Um, I introduce Mark. He specialises in banking and finance, but of particular interest today, he's also, uh, dare I say, an expert, uh, a specialist perhaps in energy and infrastructure projects. Um, and he works with both the private and the public sector uh, to set up and restructure the types of projects we're probably going to be talking uh, a little bit about today. Um, hopefully, I haven't embarrassed you too much, Mark, with that introduction. How are you this morning? Hi there, Nick. Uh, no, thanks for having me on. I'm very well, thank you. No, it's, uh, it's an interesting topic and uh, yeah, some of the things we've been up to in the past do shed some light on how we should all be thinking about this. Um, I'm sure we'll get into it in the, as the session progresses, but yeah, very well, Nick. Thank you. Good, good. Um, well, let's get into it then, uh, I think. Um, so we heard in in the, the budget, which seems a long, long time ago now, but it is only, what, a month ago, uh, that the Chancellor uh, was setting up uh, at the National Infrastructure Bank. We'd, we'd already heard a bit about it actually in, in October, November the previous year, I think. It, so it was led uh, quite well. It wasn't unexpected. Um, so, so Mark, um, well, first of all, let's start with, with the, the, the most simple question. Why has the government established the bank? Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely the right place to start. Um, and you, you're absolutely right that we have been hearing a, a, quite a bit about this for some time. Um, and and it's been in, it was interesting leading up to the, the reset announcement to, to sort of dip into some of the discussions that were taking place because we had uh, we had the usual suspect saying, well, hold, hold on a minute, we've got lots of liquidity out there in the market from, from, from private banks, you know, commercial banks and institutional lenders. Uh, why do we need another one? Um, uh, and also, we don't have a funding model for uh, infrastructure projects in this country. Um, or, or, or in, that is actually correct. In, in England, at least, we've got one in Wales and we've got one in Scotland. We don't have one in England. So how is this going to help us if we don't actually know how we're going to get all this stuff to work anyway? Um, but I, I think it, it's really been interesting to see how the local authority angle has been played into the discussion. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, I guess, what that means if we bring all the strands of discussion um, together in, in, a, in a second. But yeah, so what, why, why have we got a national infrastructure bank? Well, in, if you look at the, the kind of things that are on the tin about building back better, net zero 2050 and levelling up, they're all obviously very credible objectives. Um, levelling up, one of the three uh, pillars uh, is infrastructure. Um, and of course, it's all about stimulating short term economic activity, driving long term productivity improvements. Um, and we hear banded around the fact that there'll be 100 billion pounds of, of 600 billion for of, of gross public sector investment in the whole uh, levelling up agenda. We've got net zero agenda, 12 billion of funding for projects through the 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution that we need to try and um, somehow deploy as well. Um, uh, and uh, I suppose it's as well to try and encourage private sector investment in infrastructure. Um, but what we really mean here is in, in encouraging private sector investment in infrastructure um, where the market currently cannot provide that finance to, to crowd in, to use the, the term that everyone's now using, to crowd in all the types of finance to make this work. And this is a really important point for, for local authorities because banks have a very uh, tick box approach to providing finance and actually if there isn't a you know a very clear source of revenues and there isn't um, something really which has been done before it, it doesn't get easily financed um, and I'm thinking they're in a project finance type mentality where you're looking at revenues you're looking at future cash flow generation from a particular infrastructure or, or energy uh, project as opposed to a corporate lend where you just look at what the company group is up to as a whole. That 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 traditionally is how a lot of energy and infrastructure projects in, in this country have been financed on a project finance basis. So it's about trying to encourage um, uh, the financing of, of types of uh, project which today haven't been um, haven't been viable uh, from 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 private lenders. Um, 
Uh, and I guess um, it, it, the, the other big purpose of, of the bank here is, is to provide a discussion for, for local authorities to get involved in about how best to do this. Uh, and as part of that, to provide a, a, a set of tools for local authorities to make this work. And I can't underestimate how useful that could be because in the whole, in, in the PFI era, we had the Infrastructure and Products Authority providing guidance to the, the procuring authorities, the public sector side of PFI transactions, helping them structure it, providing guidance, providing mandatory drafting for the, for the product agreements. And, and then more recently, that that body, the Infrastructure and Projects Authority, has been guiding through, guiding local authorities through how to deal with projects that aren't gone, haven't gone to plan, uh, or, or terminating those projects to pass um, the assets back to the public sector. And, and our understanding is that that body, the Infrastructure and Projects Authority, will move into the bank, mm. and it will provide, a, it will provide a, a ramp up of that guidance for local authorities on how to do the, how, how to make this work. So that that I guess is. In a kind of long and windy way, the the things that come to mind for me about why we're why we're doing this. Cool. I don't know, Nick, is that is that how you're seeing it as well? Was anything anything that you could see as well? Uh, well, I think that was quite a uh, quite a full answer. I, th I think part of the issue here, though, is is Brexit as well, uh, and so clearly there's there's a focus on how do we replace the EIB's investment into the UK. Perhaps we'll cover that uh, um, maybe later, um, okay. perhaps. Um, I, I guess I guess to complete the, this kind of uh, what what will what why is it and what will it do? So what kind of projects do you think they're looking at funding? Yeah, so the, and this this is something where they where the guidance published so far is a little bit round up and out, and it doesn't. I guess you might say it's a little bit misleading, uh, Nick, in, in as much as we think of infrastructure as as very broad, and you and I were. We've had this conversation. You, you, infrastructure is, is a very generic sounding term, but actually we're talking about innovative in infrastructure, the kind of things which uh, cannot be, as they currently financed by the, 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 the usual suspects in, in energy infrastructure finance. So to provide some specifics then, we're talking about things like carbon capture, utilisation, storage. Um, we're, we're talking about things like sustainable aviation fuel or hydrogen infrastructure or battery infrastructure. But th things which to date really have not been financeable because they are innovative and they don't have a track record. Um, and, and we've picked those up from conversations with, you know, across, across industry, conversations with in the Infrastructure and Products Authority. So I guess but for those um, for those on the call on, on, on the webcast who who think their area could benefit from um, any of those things I've just mentioned or other innovative infrastructure because you, you know I know many local authorities have got plenty of solar PV in their area now and, and some have onshore wind but where you where you've got a gap where you, where you actually want to, to, to enhance your green credentials it would be those innovative types of infrastructure and 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 actually it could combine for example um, traditional infrastructure with innovative infrastructure so you might have um, you know, a, a, a solar park, which obviously only generates electricity during the day. Um, what, what do you do overnight? You, 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 could, you, could you introduce battery storage to that project so that you, you, you obviously have a much more constant flow of electricity coming from that particular asset? There, there are things like that which can be done. And the whole battery storage industry is really picking, picking, um, uh, really ramping up now at something which is gen genuinely an industry in itself, as opposed to something which people have just been speaking to for some time. I suppose other examples are um, digital infrastructure. So um, we've, we've heard about altnets taking shape, um, alternative networks. So in, in I guess, more rural areas where um, it's not to date been uh, so economically attractive for the big players to, to, to roll out gigabit broadband. Uh, we've seen um, a number of partnerships between local authorities and, and private developers in, in digital infrastructure um, to, to, to fill the gap there. And there's potentially something in it quite significantly for, for local authority partners who get, them, get, get involved in the, the, these initiatives because the, 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 the plan for the developer is to develop something which is um, quite technically challenging, but ultimately is valuable to 
the likes of a Virgin Media or, or, or other big player to acquire. And of course, if you can get yourself into a structure which generates something uh, meaningful for a big player and gets sold, everyone can can share in that upside. And that, that's certainly the strategy we're seeing a number of private developers really trying to uh, establish. And if, if you get a local authority in, in the club as well, then there's obviously a gain there to be had um, on both sides. So there's some examples, Nick, I think. Yeah, thanks. You mentioned something interesting, though. You mentioned something about some of these projects being un unfinanceable. But what, yeah. do you, what do you mean by that? Or why is that the case? Yeah, so the traditional, the, the traditional requirement in project finance is that you have a, you have a contracted revenue stream mm -hmm. for a number of years, which is longer than the, the, the period of time to repay your debt. So if, you, if, you need, if, if you've got a loan of, say, 15 years or 18 years because actually it, it's a it's an expensive capital um, intensive uh, project to develop the traditional argument is well you need to have a, a, a someone who's who can purchase the electricity that this generates over at least 18 years and, and if you don't have that certainty because you need that certainty it's not financeable so the, the traditional argument was you need to have long-term um, offtake or, or long-term concession if it's more of an infrastructure rather than an energy type of um, initiative. The market has definitely changed in recent years where we've got, um, for instance, in data centres of digital infrastructure, we've got folks who have got the big players who just do, do not need to have and do not want to have long-term supply uh, or rather long-term participation in, in a data centre because it might not suit them uh, and they can't see down the track long term. Or, or it may be the case that actually you don't need a power purchase agreement for more than five years because there's plenty of people who will want to purchase the power. Um, so the market has changed and come away from having such a rigid view as to uh, what needs to be contracted at day one. But that, that traditionally is the, is the, I guess, the mathematical problem or, or financial problem. The, the other the other side of it, though, is when you've got innovative technology, which just simply hasn't been proven. So um, in an energy or energy or infrastructure project, the, the usual philosophy is you, you, you go ahead because you've contracted all of the things that are going to be required to make this work. And if it's innovative technology, you don't necessarily have certainty that the technology is going to work to be able to generate the power or, or, or provide the service um, for a longer period of time. And I mean, we're going we're going very slightly off topic here, but um, offshore wind um, uh, banks are being asked in offshore wind to finance turbines which haven't even been announced yet to the market. So th there's 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 a big desire to really take take as much advantage of poss as possible with the technology that is coming down the track. But of course, it's not been proven, so it's not bankable to a very traditional um, financier. It's, it's interesting you mentioned offshore wind. That was used as one of the case studies in the policy document, actually, to, to say, well, um, you know, there's there's a, a case study of success here. Exactly. The, the, in the EIB as well were, were used as, as the as the kind of what the the cornerstone financer yeah. of that project to bring private sector in and, and look at it now. Exactly. And, and again, so the national it, infrastructure policy team are looking at that and saying we can do the same thing. It's a it's a re, it's a genuinely interesting example, and you know you sometimes see examples in 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 policy documents. You think I'm not not really sure about that, but this one is a genuinely you know a genuinely good example. So if we rewind ten years ago, ten years back, um, our offshore wind was was new technology. Um, it was risky technology. It's very, it's very difficult to install. If your turbine doesn't operate or breaks down you don't generate any electricity, so you don't generate a return. It's a you know risky, a risky thing to do. But the EIB came along and said, look, if, if we finance half of this or quarter of this, how's about everyone else um, joining in as well? And that's exactly what happened. And w without EIB, it, it's really truly the case that, that that industry would not have taken off at the same speed or at all in this country in the same way. The problem with the EIB, and it's a good it's a good example because it also d demonstrates a, a, a shortcoming with the EIB is that it probably hung around in the space a bit too long. Mm -hmm. um, so on the more recent offshore wind projects, um, EIB was still there as a participant, but it probably didn't need to be because mm -hmm. banks were falling over themselves to try and get into the, the lending syndicate because such as established 
you know, industry now, even though, as we've said, the technology is changing, it, it, it didn't need to, to hang around. And if, if we can use offshore wind as an example of what the art of the possible is in for new technology, and we think about how local authorities can provide their their the, the benefit well, can, can one identify and, and help structure alongside private partners who who can develop something in their area for the for the, for the good of their area the economic social and environmental well-being of their area um, and we bring the the expertise that that local authorities have with obviously the the benefit of borrowing um, relatively cheaply and on lending at, at, at market rates um, there's a there's a really big opportunity there to to, to see the next offshore wind um, industry in the UK, which you know it could be hydrogen infrastructure uh, as a replacement for, for, for electric vehicles, given the sort of challenges with with charging electric vehicles at, at scale. So yeah, it's uh, it, again apologies for slightly long winding answer there, but there is definitely something uh, to be uh, reflected on from the EIB offshore wind story. Mm. Okay, I suppose that brings us into to kind of what fine kind of financing tools uh, the uh, National Infrastructure Bank is thinking of using. Again, as with all our discussion here, we, we're kind of going on quite thin information, although it was uh, there's a few documents out in the public domain from the Treasury. Um, the the further documents haven't been published yet, so so there is, there is a focus on on kind of spring. I think we're already in spring, although the weather would suggest otherwise at the moment. But uh, maybe late spring to to get more information here, uh, and also summer perhaps for the first um, loans or, or financing agreements to be made. So it's it's quite a short time frame. Um, in terms of what we do know, uh, and this feeds into what you were saying, Mark, about. Um, you know, unfinanceable, unbankable, you know, the risk area uh, for, for very innovative projects. Um, the, the policy document does talk about, well, actually the, the National Infrastructure Bank will get involved in debt, senior debt, but also hybrid debt, so mezzanine finance, equity. So actually investing in the in these projects and actually all, all companies and actually taking taking a loss. So, so you're not, not just being uh, the senior lender there. Uh, and also they're going to um, they're going to bring in the UK guarantee scheme. So they've got 10 billion of guarantees to, to potentially play with. Um, so that first loss is, is clearly quite important for those innovative uh, innovative projects you were talking about. Uh, and also perhaps where the EIB used to come in uh, and maybe crowding in, but eventually crowding out perhaps to, to go on your to go on your example. Um, for local authorities, perhaps in particular, there's a, there's very much a focus on advisory services. So going back to what you were saying about the IPA, um, someone sitting there and helping local authorities, uh, advising them through these very complex projects. You know, it's a bit different from just borrowing from the PDRB for, to, to develop the school, for instance. So these are long and winding roads in many cases. Um, so there's clearly, it's clearly been thought about in terms of what the bank can provide and what it can get involved in. Um, I suppose that brings us on to, to what would it do for local authorities in particular. Uh, so as part of the um, as part of the um, kind of the setup, um, it, it's got a, in, in terms of its in terms of its firepower, it's been talked about it's 22 billion. I think 10, 10 billion guarantees and a mixture of debt and equity for, for the, the other 12. Um, and but four billion of of this financing is being set aside for to lend to local authorities, as you said, Mark, on, on some of those some of those projects that might be quite interesting going forward. Um, and they're going to be lent. Actually, they're going to be lent at the infrastructure rate, which is quite weird because we all we all know what the infrastructure rate is. Um, uh, I think we've had a, a, a chat to the the people we have run a couple of infrastructure rate um, bidding processes, and I, I don't think they've ever been taken up in full. But the the if if you have a project that that meets the required criteria for the old infrastructure rate uh, bidding processes, then you could borrow at gilts plus sixty, and that's exactly the same as we're talking about here for the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, it may be that scrutiny again, scrutiny is quite focused on in the policy document, so that these projects are going to be scrutinised uh, quite substantially. I would have thought, uh, and they've also got to be of a certain size, so over five million. Um, but I think that's a lot less than actually with the IB involvement isn't it because I think those used to have to be fairly substantial projects to get the ERB 
um, involved. Is that right, Mark, for, from your memory? I'm sure that's right. I mean, we've, we've generally, in fact, we've only seen EIB on, on much larger projects um, than, than, five, than five million, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think I think just, just picking up a couple of, of, of points you mentioned there about the scrutiny and the process, Cer certainly it will not be the process that local authorities currently expect for PWLB borrowing in terms of the, the sort of you know, relatively straightforward question and answer that process that needs to take place. Um, we are expecting a formal loan um, uh, agreement um, or some, something definitely more than those questions because that will then be novated to the, well it will initially be with the Treasury and then novated to the, the bank later so we're expecting something more substantial. On, on, the, on the scrutiny side, um, I mean, yes, you're right, there will be scrutiny, but I'm hoping, given the experience of, of IPA in the past, that that is a very positive thing, because the, one of the reasons the IPA became the body it became is, is really to protect public sector and, and help them get things right, um, because the very early PFI projects probably weren't quite right in, in terms of um, the, the benefits that the private sector got out of them. Uh, and more, more latterly in, in the sort of dying days of PFI and PF2, it was a much more balanced um, um, outcome. So I think that scrutiny is um, very helpful and also just uh, taking the pressure off local authorities from from trying to structure these things when, you, when everyone's got a million other things to do. I think that that will be will be very positive. Um, and, but but ultimately, it's that package of support as well as being able to provide the finance at point six um, above above guilt, um, which, which I think is 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 the attraction here. And you just go back to the numbers. Yeah, four billion probably doesn't sound all that much, but we we do see in other uh, markets um, how if you if you just provide a bit of secure debt, which, which is covered by first loss or some other enhancement, it does seem to make a much bigger difference. Um, and the important thing to, to remember here is that, that the plan is not that the National Infrastructure Bank finances 100% of the debt in, in a, an infrastructure project that comes through. There's an expectation that there will be someone else who will provide the finance as well. So um, that, that also could be, I, I suppose you can see it both ways, you know, it's kind of easier and simpler just to have one lender because you just do it all yourself. But if you do have an established infrastructure lender come in and lend alongside a local authority um, they, they will have a lot of expertise to bring and they, they will want to make sure it really does work uh, for everyone mm. uh, rather than um, just kind of cross their hand cross their arms and, and wait to sign it, it definitely won't be the case so yeah so the, the the loans to local authorities in conjunction with the statutory powers you know facilitating um, benefits to the area I think are are, are the, the, the key here. Mm, that's a really good point about um, it, it possibly wouldn't be 100% of the project to bring other partners in. And ag again, um, looking at the way the bank's being set up, that seems to be part of the advisory role, the, the, the bringing yeah. partners together, uh, which which could be multiple funders, of course, uh, will probably be very useful for local authorities, I, I would have thought. As you said, local authorities do a lot of things and, and not always got to concentrate on, on very large projects. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Mark. Um, it, so the, the setup, the bank's not actually set up yet, of course. Uh, so initial loans to local authorities will be made through the PWLB. Uh, and then, as you said, novated over um, from the DMO to um, to the bank when it's actually set up. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work, because as you said, it's a formal loan agreement in place. So it's a bit different from the PWLB. Um, what's quite interesting for local authorities is that Again, the, the process will be different from the PWLB, but also the types of product will be different from the PWLB as well. Uh, a lot more focus on, on infrastructure type finance. So uh, um, kind of forward starting packages or uh, facility type packages where you can draw down as you need along the project space. Um, uh, with with um, amortization schedules perhaps that actually work for the project rather than just the, the standard ones you can get from the PDLB. So that's really quite interesting for local authorities that used to kind of the the fantastic convenience of the PDLB, um, but the limited flexibility of, of kind of the, the, the cash that's available from it, um, which doesn't always work for projects. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of, I think we've we've kind of covered benefits a bit I mean we've talked about attractive pricing 
which, yeah. which for, for local authorities is, is key. The project support, as you said, it, you know, perhaps I was being a bit negative on the scrutiny side, but you actually, you've quite rightly said, actually, for these projects, it, it's valid. Uh, and it's a necessary component of getting these uh, things off the ground started. Um, the risk sharing, how, how do you think that will work? Will that be more on the public sector side or, or will it be will it be blended risk sharing? Well, I'm, I'm really hoping um, from, from everything we've heard that actually ultimately the National Infrastructure Bank will be bearing the risk that the, the innovative structure or innovative technology or, 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 or other innovative aspects present and actually um, that there shouldn't be, for, the, for this to work, there shouldn't be really increased risk on anyone apart from the National in Infrastructure Bank. It clear, clearly, it won't be quite as black and white as that, but that, I think, is where I see it, Nick. OK, cool. Um, clearly, um, the one thing on everyone's lips, really, as soon as this was announced, was will it replace adequately the IB, we've touched upon this a, a little bit. So what do you think about this, Mark? Um, you're well, a lot closer to that side of the market. Yeah, it's um, so the, I think I think we've sort of touched on how um, the, the, the EIB had, had its had its role and, and all, almost had it had it had its day in in certain types of infrastructure um, and, and also how it financed things which it didn't really need to finance by by the end of its time in, in the UK infrastructure. So I don't really see um, in, from, from a certain angle, I don't really see the National Infrastructure Bank as replacing EIB, more, more as providing something better. I, and I, I really do think that because okay. it does have a focus on, on things that the market will not do, whereas the EIB had lost that focus. Uh, so, so yeah, that, I think that's where I see that. OK, that's a, that's a good answer. I mean, I, we, there is a mixed message, isn't there, from from kind of industry or, or the market from that. Some are saying, well, the, because it's more focused, it's not going to replace the EIB, uh, which is the other side of the argument. You're saying it's not going to finance the, the kind of infrastructure projects that uh, perhaps the EIB looked at. So not just the, the innovative, the, the renewable, the, the energy type things, but but roads, bridges, et cetera. It's, it probably certainly won't be doing those kind of things. It's, it's very much focused on um, the net zero, although some of the levelling up agenda might might encapsulate some of that, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so. One question, actually, very good, uh, very good question here is the EIB was seen as cumbersome. Um, do you what would what you think? Do you think the N, the NIB, do you think they'll be more uh, more agile? Uh, we don't know yet, of course, but I'm just throwing throwing the, the ball at you there to see what you come back with. So the, the, e, the EIB became very, in, hopefully I'm all right to say, the EIB did become, become quite entrenched in doing things a particular way. Um, which helped when it was doing what it had done before, but didn't help on, on the innovative side of things. And certainly we saw on, on other projects where we didn't go to plan and EIB were involved, it was that they were, it's absolutely right that they were administratively burdensome to, to deal with, <laughs> if I'm all right saying that. Uh, but at the moment, we don't know um, exactly how the National Infrastructure Bank will, will operate. Um, we, all I can say is that the from the conversations we've had with the IPA, which I think will be running quite a bit of this, I'm, I'm more encouraged than discouraged about the process. Um, we, it's not like we are starting completely from scratch here. We've got the benefit of um, the EIB's experience. We've also seen failures in other markets, for instance, Canada with the can Canadian infrastructure plan that didn't really work um, because it wasn't focused enough. I think mean, if the focus is right and the, the team is there to, to do this, it should it, it it will be obviously interesting to see how it how it starts initially. But I'm not I'm not fearing it's going to be so administratively burdensome that it it can't operate um, and be helpful. Um, so yeah, that that would be my answer there. Okay. Um, in terms of in terms of where we go. Uh, so we've already talked about uh, the next announcements in the spring. Well, we're already in the spring, so we'll, we'll see where that goes. Um, the, the, the kind of government's road plan of this does, does point to 2024 before being um, set up in statute. And, and do, does that mean, do you think that actually this is quite a slow, going to be a slow process? Do you think it's going to get lost in the 
coronavirus um, response. Um, what do you think about timing? Yeah, so we, we've mentioned spring a few times. I think it's clear there's not going to be a big uh, a big movement this spring, uh, even though that that is obviously it would be nice. And um, from what from what we are hearing, 12 to 18 months before you know it's fully operational, rather than all the way till 2024. Um, so I think, yeah, this year, to my mind, this, this year could be wisely spent uh, taking stock of what the opportunities might be in, in um, the areas um, that the, the local authorities on the call uh, are, are operating, both geographically, where there are gaps in, uh, in technology to, to progress the green agenda. Um, and, and, and also to have those conversations with Treasury and, and, and the IPA about what kind of you know early versions of toolkits might be available to uh, you know facilitate early conversations and also just to be very open about the possibility of partnering with um, local developers who've got the ideas, who've got the, you know, the drive and the energy, but just have struggled with with conventional lenders in the past, and to be open to have those conversations, I think I think if this year can be um, used wisely, it would be, to my mind, it would be it would be that way. Mm. And that's by local authorities, isn't it, or, or the public sector entities? Actually, it, it's it's hard to see with with all the other pressures local authorities are under coming up with these projects themselves. I, I guess to some extent. So I, I think that's right. I think I mean I don't have a sort of magic bullet solution to this but we, we we do get people who come to our organization with with ideas we you know with with battery storage with hydrogen technology and they ask us you know who, who can who can we speak to to get this to work and you know we, we kind of we, we do sometimes have to caution well you know the, the, the commercial banks probably will not finance this um so we now know, of course, that, that there is a new angle here, which is to refer them to lo local authorities who would be interested in progressing these themselves. So, so yeah, that, that, that is the, I think that is the difference here, Nick, yeah. Yeah, definitely, particularly with the, the climate emergency agenda that's that's been voted on by many local authorities, you would have thought some of these more innovative green projects might actually tick some boxes. Um, yeah, they, they, they tick boxes. The, 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 the challenge has always been that stability of revenues. And, and I think, as we've said, with the, with the statutory powers of, of, of local authorities and, and the, the agenda in their area, may, maybe that also helps offset some of the, I guess, less certainty with the, with the revenue stream that traditional finances would need. So, yeah, it's, it's looking at everything more broadly. Yeah, cool. Um... Well, I think we, we've probably covered that. Uh, what little we know, we've probably covered that quite widely. Actually, it's been really <laughs> useful, Mark. Uh, so, so very much, uh, very much. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, I think uh, just see if we've got any any more questions. They seem to be coming all from the same person. Um, I think we've kind of covered these. Do you see LA's having the specialist knowledge to progress such ideas regarding funding? Well, I think that's where you need the partnership, perhaps with the National Infrastructure Bank, with other funders and, and with the developers coming forward with the projects as well. So uh, I think that part of the National Infrastructure Bank's um, reason for being is to bring all those parties together, I guess, and make these projects work, which you said, as you said, the, the IPA was instrumental in doing in, in, in its previous guise. So um, yeah. I, th I think going forward, it's like you say, it's just about, for, for our local authority clients in particular, a bit being open, um, open with that for our four ideas, maybe uh, from developers yeah. or, or from other parties. Uh, perhaps speaking to us or yourself about, you know, how do we take this forward or, or even speaking to kind of the, the HMT or, or or the IPA uh, to see, you know, what are things that are going to be interesting to you? Um, because, of course, the, the PDLB, well, the National Infrastructure Bank via the PDLB is meant to be ready, meant to be ready in summer to start lending through the PDLB for, for these time of loans. Whether that's the case or not, we don't know. But as you said, this year is probably a good a good time to actually start thinking about what might work for the local area uh, and setting up for, for next year. So um, thank you, Mark. Very interesting. Uh, I hope our our, um, our listeners found it interesting as well. I don't see any more questions. So, so just to bring uh, this session to a close, uh, next week on Trending Treasury, we're going to be talking to Fitch 
uh, about uh, registered providers and local authority credit, which should be quite interesting to, to get uh, the credit um, agency view on that. Um, but other than that, uh, nothing else to say really, then thank you for listening. Thank you, Mark, again, and we'll see you next time.